Hi everyone, welcome to Five Code Shakespeare Hamlet Character Analysis. In this series, we look at a total of nine different characters, all of them in fact, and in this video, we'll look at Old King Hamlet the Ghost. What I do in each video is first identify important characteristics of the character, and then we analyze several quotes that prove the claim. If you find these videos useful, please like and subscribe, and you can instantly download a copy of the PDFs I use in this series by visiting my shop and making a one-time purchase. See the description for details. First, a quick summary of the six character traits that we'll be looking at in this video, and we'll do a quick analysis, a quick comparison with Hamlet, because you can't understand uh, the main character unless you understand him in relationship to the other characters in the play, because that's the way a good writer writes the story. He emphasizes connections with other characters to draw out uh, characteristics of the character that he wants you to focus on. Juxtapose doubles, parallel characters, character foils and antagonists, Ron, Harry, Harry Potter and Ron Weasley uh, and Hermione Granger. They're all these parallel characters that, that draw attention to different traits of Harry Potter and the same thing uh, in all of Shakespeare's plays. Uh, Shakespeare, in fact, uses a, a literary device called Hendiades, and it's, it's a repetition of parallel elements uh, connected by a simple word like and, whips and scorns of time, A and B, A and B, C and D, C and D. Go back and, and, and read your text and you'll see these all throughout the play. So, obviously, the writers want to emphasize those connections, and Shakespeare certainly did. So first of all, we see King Hamlet, uh, his appearance as the ghost. He's, he's a forbidding force. He is depicted very, very clearly as a heroic age warrior hero, uh, old school. He's an embodiment of old world values, the Greco-Roman classical values, Viking medieval values. He represents the honor code, courage, loyalty, a clear, direct action. Now, what does that sound like? That sounds like the exact opposite of what our Renaissance man is all about. Hamlet, he's an embodiment of new era values, late Middle Ages, reason, rationality, book learning, he's a student, don't forget, and the complex Christian moral and legal code. Um, we also learn from several sources, and I'm going to talk about that uh, and prove it today, he, that he was, a, he was a good king. He was a defender of the nation. He was a provider of stability. He expanded the empire, or at least protected the empire. In contrast, we don't really know what kind of king he would, he would, uh, Hamlet would turn out to be. Fortinbras, at the end of Hamlet, says that he would have been a good, good king. I suppose he would have been a good king in the modern era, modern era king, I think, when peace is already, has already been established by uh, the old world warriors, perhaps. He was potentially a good peacetime leader. It's a question. Uh, good King Hamlet, old King Hamlet was a loving husband. That's very, very clear. And I'm going to make that, I'll make my case for that quite strongly. Uh, a lot of the things I'll talk about in this video, by the way, are question marks. We don't quite know because we don't get a lot. We don't learn a lot about him, but we learn enough to make some, make some claims. Tentative claims, at least. So he was a loving husband, I believe. He was compassionate. Uh, he was a forgiving protector. He was tolerant of, of weakness that he saw in other people. In contrast, <laughs> Hamlet is an unloving son. He rips into his mother mercilessly. He's unforgiving and he's intolerant of weakness. Now, both of these characters, I believe, are puritanical. Hamlet, clear evidence. Go back and watch my Hamlet video here. The link is there. Uh, Hamlet definitely was had pur a puritanical streak. He was an idealist, an absolutist. He had a disgust for the earthly realm, a disgust for physical earthly existence. I think it probably came from King Hamlet, although there's not a lot of evidence. There is some evidence. I think he might have been a no-fun husband that drove... Gertrude to have an affair with Claudius, maybe. Again, this is quite tentative, but I, but but there is some evidence. It comes mostly from from evidence from Hamlet, the father and the son. You know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So, uh, was he arrogant and domineering? Was he a bully brother to Claudius, and that's why Claudius murdered him? Probably must have been the case, or 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 at least. Uh, 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 Claudius must have been intimidated and, and frustrated by his older brother. And was he an arrogant, domineering father? And I've proved, and I've, I've, I've argued in other videos, like the Hamlet video, that he probably was. He probably uh, overpowered uh, um, his, his, his brother, uh, uh, sorry, his son, probably in the same way that he did his brother. Now, is Hamlet arrogant? I think he is, but he's arrogant in a very different way. He doesn't have that strength of, that old world strength of masculine uh, a character that, that his father had, but he's arrogant in, in a kind of new, squishy kind of way. He's very snobby. He feels very superior to everybody. He's disdainful of, of, of people in the court, and he's very, very unkind as well. Uh, now, this is kind of neat, too. If you're interested in storytelling and the mechanics of storytelling and the difficulty and the sausage making of storytelling, this is really, really cool. You'll find this interesting. He, he's, a, he, he's a device. Uh, the ghost is a device. King Hamlet is a device. He's a revenge plot device. He is the ghost, the memory that announces the transgression 
in a revenge plot, and there has to be a transgression, some kind of crime that has to be corrected. He's also the victim that calls the hero to action in the revenge plot story. So that's kind of cool too. Now, of course, Hamlet plays his part in the revenge plot story because he is the hero. But Shakespeare being Shakespeare, he took a genre, the, the John Wick kind of very popular revenge uh, plot, and he made a variation of it. Uh, Hamlet is, is supposed to be the hero, like John Wick, but he's not, of course. Uh, he's a brilliant variation on the theme of the hero. He's, the, he's the, uh, the revenge hero who can't avenge, which is a real problem. Okay, let's get into the meat of the video. King Hamlet, the heroic age warrior. As we've mentioned, King Hamlet was a tough guy. He was an old world tough guy, a heroic age warrior for sure, and Shakespeare makes it clear throughout the entire play. Allusions to the Greco-Roman world, the old pagan uh, uh, warrior world of honor uh, and, and duty and those stoic uh, uh, qualities. Um, allusions to that world were very, very common in Renaissance arts. Go to one of the galleries of Europe and you'll see painting after painting uh, depicting uh, uh, the heroic uh, deeds of, of Mars and Zeus, Jove, and and Mercury, Hermes. I mean, these guys are all over the place. But so it's not unusual that we, that Shakespeare was Shakespeare was very much absorbed with these these old stories. But Shakespeare takes particular pains in this play to contrast the heroic mode of being of the father with Hamlet, the son's soft, modern, intellectualized existence. He was a student. He's coming back from Wittenberg, and he's encountering uh, the duties of the old world, the call and the requirements of the old world that is unsuited to. Uh, uh, um, uh, to fulfill DC. Um, so in, in the play, of course, we see four allusions to Hercules alone. There, uh, he, uh, Shakespeare references Hercules four times, and here's one of them. Uh, so Hamlet's uh, saying, uh, he's comparing his father to Claudius, and he says, Claudius is, is my father's brother, but he's no more like my father than I to Hercules. And what he's saying here is, is that my, he's implying that his father was a, a legend of masculine courage and strength uh, and, and performance uh, like Hercules, and I am none of that, DC. So right at the beginning of the play, right in Act 1, Scene 2, Shakespeare is setting up the contrast between these two worlds, DC, the, the heroic and the unheroic. I get into this in a lot more detail in this video, so you can click on that link if you'd like to. Um, so King Hamlet embodies, as we said, the masculine heroic ideals of strength, courage, honor, duty, loyalty, direct action, none of which Hamlet possesses, the poor guy, but he's expected to follow this code despite embodying the values of the new era, the complex Christian moral code, St. Augustine's virtues of Athenian reason, rationality in the Christian context. Uh, of course, Western civilization got a lot of its intellectual uh, um, uh, a lot of the intellectual benefits from the Athenians, the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, not the Spartans, because the Spartans were more like old King Hamlet. They were the warriors, of course, but but the Athenians were the learners, were the thinkers. And St. Augustine, he was a, 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 a Middle Ages uh, uh, scholar, Christian scholar, and he took uh, the, the, the Athenian Greek rigor, academic rigor, and he applied it to a Christian world. And, and, I, and I point this out because that's the world that Hamlet is inhabiting, and it's in strong contrast to the old Bay wolf monster slayer culture that the father represents. Now it's important to think of the, these two principles uh, as principles and vital principles, both of them equally important. It's the yin and the yang, the feminine and the masculine. If you don't have both, then you've got a corrupt soul. And if you don't have both, you have a corrupt and weak or brutal culture. W uh, 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 wars come from a, a, a disproportion. Too much masculine in a culture, you've got you know aggression and, and needless war and suffering. If you get too much feminine in a culture, you get weakness and you get uh, uh, in, in, uh, instability in that regard. So the zeitgeist founded on feminine principles uh, of, of pity, compassion, and love. That's what Hamlet uh, represents more. And there's a zeitgeist founded on masculine virtues of, of the protector, the clearing of space for civilization. The world is a nasty place. Uh, humans can be nasty, so we need to defend against other nasty humans. But in the older world, and still today, uh, there were bears and tigers that needed to be cleared out of the zone so that we can live peacefully and have, uh, you know, raise babies and, and play soccer on a pitch without getting eaten by a, by a leopard or, a, or something like that. So here's some evidence of that, uh, of, of the contrast between these two worlds and how unsuited Hamlet is to the requirements of that, of that older world. So when Hamlet encounters the ghost, he says, alas, poor ghost. Now, what's that? Alas, poor ghost. His heart breaks. His heart breaks. Can you imagine a warrior guy, like a real brutal, tough, tough guy, encountering a ghost, and, 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 and 
the, his first response is an emotional response. No, uh, 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 one of these old tough guys would be more stoical. They would look the problem in the eye and say, yeah, that really sucks, but the, we got to do something about it. Do you see? Not so Hamlet. He, re, he responds in a feminine way. Not necessarily negative, but it's in a feminine way. So he says, alas, poor ghost. And what does the ghost do? He slaps his son down and says, pity me not. But, but smarten up, man up, and lend thy serious hearing to what I shall unfold. So there's this voice saying, no, pity is not going to help in this situation. We have a job to do. You, son, have a job to do. So Hamlet, of course, he straightens himself up and he says, speak, I am bound by duty to hear. Fair enough, he's going to try. And again and again and again in the play, you hear this. Hamlet trying to man up to the situation, trying to man up to the situation. And I'm not saying that the feminine uh, 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 Hamlet has no virtues. He really does. As I've mentioned, uh, Fortinbras says that, yeah, Hamlet was a good guy. He was a smart guy. And if the world had been a different place, he might have been a really, really good peacetime leader. But, you know, the snakes, that's Claudius. And Hamlet's not the kind of guy to clear the world of the Claudius snakes, do you see? That's the tragedy of this play. Uh, and the ghost says, he agrees with Hamlet, good, son, good, you're going you're gonna to man up and do your duty, so art thou, you are bound to revenge. I'm calling on you from the grave to, 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 to do the, the warrior's job, to, to get revenge, to avenge my murder. You will be bound to revenge when you shall hear what I have to say, do you see? So the warriors scorn pity. Action is more useful, and that's not wrong. It's not wrong. It's not the entire picture, but it's not wrong. Okay, so I've got more really good evidence for uh, um, uh, the warrior uh, the warrior old king right here. So we're going to look at that now when we talk about King Hamlet, the good king. By at least three accounts in the plague, uh, King Hamlet was indeed a good king. Horatio says so, Hamlet says so, and King Hamlet himself says so. So let's have a look at, at, uh, at, at what is said. So by three accounts, King Hamlet was a good king, a good ruler, as well as a fierce and a heroic age warrior, most reliably. Now remember, uh, Horatio in this play, he's kind of the Benvolio from, from Romeo and Juliet. Benvolio is a trustworthy third party, kind of a third party, uh, a level-headed kind of guy, and that's what Horatio is. So we can, we can trust what he says. So most reliably, reliably, honest broker Horatio seems to have met King Hamlet more than once and claims that he was indeed a good ruler. So he says here in Act 1, Scene 1, he says, I saw your father once, Hamlet. I saw uh, uh, the king once, and he was a goodly king, he says. So that's, I, I, I pretty much, I believe that. Um, now, whether, now it's kind of confusing. He, he says later on, he says, I knew your father, and these hands are not more like uh, the ghost that I saw. You're, you're, the ghost is very much like your father in the same way that my hands are, are, are the, similar to each other. So it, I just put this in here because uh, that's not very convincing. If you only see a guy once and maybe at a distance you shake his hand and that's it, how do you know he's a good king? But this suggests that he knew him uh, more he, more closely. He, he spent more time at the court. Anyway, but yeah, again, he's he's the Benvolio Horatio character, so we, we can kind of trust what he says. That There's a contrast between uh, Horatio's praise of him as a goodly king, which means a lot of things. Not just that he was a fierce warrior and, and, and a good and a good soldier, uh, but that he was a, a just ruler, a level-headed just ruler. That's the implication here. Now here, in two places, Horatio describes uh, uh, King Hamlet's uh, strength, old world strength that, that uh, benefits Denmark greatly. So Horatio's accounts uh, certainly suggest King Hamlet did great service for Denmark. Besides defeating the Poles in this, uh, in this description here, King Hamlet defeated Norway. And sp not only that, so he not, not only was he the warrior that could, that could kill people, he defeated Norway and spared the lives of his troops by opting for single combat. He wasn't a coward. He didn't send his troops into battle and let them die. There was a deal made, and here, here is the description here. So our last king was, as you know, by Fortinbras of Norway, there too pricked on by the most emulate pride. He was dared to single combat to decide the battle, DC, in which our valiant Hamlet, for so this side of the world of our world, known world, esteemed him, did slay this Fortinbras and won his land. So that's a great service to Denmark as a warrior, but also as a, as a, as a compassionate uh, king. He sacrificed, he was willing to sacrifice himself uh, for his troops and for his nation. He's the hero of the nation, do you see? And there's two examples of that, the Poles and uh, uh, his, his confrontation with Norway. 
So here's Hercules slaying the monsters, making the world safe for civilization. He goes out alone. He doesn't send his troops to do it. He goes out alone and he, make, he kills the snakes uh, that are threatening uh, his, his country, his countrymen, country people. Um, now, Hamlet, of course, is biased. Horatio, not so biased, but Hamlet is certainly biased because he, that's his the 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 uh, you know king hamlet is his father who he idealizes unhealthily hamlet is biased but the praise he heaps on his father is probably at least partly true king hamlet's deeds and horatio's opinion confirm his kingliness as we've just discussed if not his godliness he's not a god and but hamlet thinks he is and it confirms his nobility dignity strength and courage and justice and all of those things that we just talked about so here's hamlet describing his father now it's it's exaggerated it's way over the top because hamlet has a pathological relationship with his father which we're going to get into in more detail later on in this video but right off we can see that you know what dude your father's not exactly what you say he is but there's certainly some truth to it so he says here he says when he's when he says see what a grace was seated on this brow hyperion's curls the front of jove himself and i like mars to threaten and command a station like the herald mercury all of these old pagan gods new lighted on a heaven kissing hill a combination in a form indeed so there's all of the things all the whole package indeed wherein every god did set, did seem to set his seal to give the world assurance of a man he was a man now look at this this is what's interesting not just the physical warrior not just mars and an embodiment of, of martial strength he was embodiment of the intellect art and science that's the that's the sun god hyperion he was like zeus jove he was a, a model of governance good governance power and order and every country needs order heaven forbid we have no order uh, and mercury hermes of course who was a god of wit commerce and of course speed so he had the whole package now that's exaggerated but as we, as we've seen you put all these things together and i think it's probably true even less reliably king hamlet says of himself that he's great he praises his own superior superior character and talents and given but again given what else is said about him his claims are probably accurate now he's complaining here that his uh, <laughs> he's rightly complaining that his brother killed him uh, and he's rightly angry with his brother and he's criticizing his brother as a runt. He's saying, you runt, you killed me who was your superior. Untrue? Probably not. There are runts in the world. Ron Weasley is in the shadow of his older brothers. Very, very much so. Ron Weasley is in the shadow of Harry, his brother figure, and Hermione, his sister figure. Ron Weasley is in the shadow of all these guys. This is really true. You can be a lesser creature okay and the question is is what do you do as a less, lesser creature and i've argued in a previous video that ron weasley is the new weasleyan hero he 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 overcomes the temptation to uh, to to murder the brother dc go look at these videos the murder the the cain and abel brother murder stories very very interesting so here's the ghost complaining about his runt brother oh hamlet what a falling off was there my wife married this runt she fell off from me whose love was that of dignity that went hand in hand even with the vow i made her in marriage now that's kind of a stuffed shirt thing i'm going to talk about him as a stuffed shirt and so that 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 might be an indication that that he's not a, it's not all positive king hamlet's not all positive i want to make that clear so gertrude fell from me to this runt she declined upon a wretch wow whose natural gifts were poor to those of mine now natural gifts again look at the harry potter situation ron weasley's natural gifts are poor to all of his older brothers. Another brother is the prefect, Percy is his name, I think. His older brothers are taller, they're handsomer, they, they're more confident talking to girls, do you see? They've got, they've got more, more people skills. Yes, there are, this does exist, and I think it exists uh, uh, between Claudius and, and King Hamlet, and that's the, the, the resentment of Cain, the Cain and Abel story. Cain kills the, the, uh, the superior brother, Abel. It's probably true, but of course, uh, modesty was certainly not one of, of the ghost's uh, gifts for sure. Okay, so King Hamlet, the loving husband. There's lots of evidence to suggest that he was indeed a loving husband. Now, whether or not he was a smothering, overbearing husband is another question, but he certainly was a loving, tender husband. So Hamlet exaggerates the memory of his father's protective tenderness and his mother's affection, but evidence from both Gertrude and King Hamlet supports the truth, truth of these claims. So so here, here we see again in his first soliloquy in Act 1, Scene 5, Hamlet says, uh, My father was so excellent a king that was to this 
Hyperion to a satyr. So uh, again, there's the sun god. My father was like the sun god compared to Claudius, who was a satyr, who was a half goat man, do you see? And he was so loving to my mother that he might not be team the winds of heaven to visit her face too roughly. So he didn't, he, he protected her from the from the harm, the damaging winds of heaven, do you see? That's what a great guy he was. Now, certainly hyperbole, certainly uh, 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 an exaggeration. Heaven and earth must, I remember, why my mother would hang on him as if Increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on. The more she fed on the food of her husband, the hungrier she was for that food, which suggests that she was she was madly in love with him and 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 hung on him. Now, was it wrong? Was Gertrude faking it? Was she having an affair with Claudius at the same time she was pretending to be madly in love with her husband? Maybe. And come back. I'm working on my Gertrude video now. Come back and watch that. Gertrude is a fascinating character here. Uh, uh, was King Hamlet a possessive, overprotective guy? Ladies, is it nice to have a man who will protect you from the winds of heaven, who will take his coat off and put it over a puddle of mud so you can walk with your dainty shoes over it? Do you want that? Kind of, but kind of not, right? So some of it can be kind of uh, 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 over overprotective and possessive. Possessive. Love can be possessive as well. So come back to my Gertrude video. She's a very interesting character. Why did she have an affair with, with Claudius if he was such a nice guy? But anyway, he, he, he did dote on her, it seems. Now, now again, we can't trust Hamlet because he's, he's, he's got a pathological uh, relationship with his father, which we're going to talk about today too. Uh, but we can uh, trust uh, Gertrude's response when she's confronted with the memory of her old husband. And here's Penny uh, uh, Downey in uh, the 19, uh, sorry, the, the 2009 version, which is the best version that I found of Hamlet. And she's a wonderful, she does a great job of Gertrude. And here she is looking at the image of her dead husband. And that's not contempt. That's not uh, frustration at overprotectiveness. That's real regret that he's gone. So Gertrude's response to Hamlet's accusations when he's wagging his finger in this terrible scene uh, uh, suggests that her, his, Hamlet's appraisal of the father here is accurate. At first she's defiant and she says, why are you so, why, what, what, why are you in my face and telling me uh, how to behave? What, what have I done that, that, that deserves your censure? Uh, at first she is defiant, but then she, she's reminded of her betrayal and she's confronted with the memory of her dead husband and she's tortured, absolutely tortured. Three times she says, stop, stop, I can't handle it. You're killing me. You're killing me, Hamlet. Three times. It is legitimate response. She's not faking it. If she was faking it here, she's not faking it here, which suggests that, yes, she did love him. Uh, so Gertrude said, oh, Hamlet, speak no more. So he's ripping her to shreds. Oh, Hamlet, speak no more. Thou turns my eyes into my very soul, and there I see such black and grainy spots as will not leave their tinct. So there I'm stained permanently by your accusations because they're accurate, because I did betray a good man, do you see? So that's, that's pretty strong evidence. Again, the fact that she says it at least three times. Most tellingly of all are the actions of the ghost himself. Now, if he was, if, if if she did, no, it's a question, and I'm exploring it in my next video. If she did have an affair uh, with Claudius while he was alive, he, which I'm going to argue she probably did. There's a chance that she didn't, but she probably did. Uh, he should be angry. He should be, he should be, let her rot in hell. Hamlet's tear her to shreds. Hamlet kill her. I want my revenge on her for, for, for being mean to me, but he doesn't. He again, he protects her from the winds of heaven. Watch this. Most tellingly, even though he was betrayed by Gertrude, King Hamlet remains loving and protective, forgiving and compassionate. He twice calls on Hamlet, twice in the play. Now once, maybe coincidence, when a writer puts something in there twice or three times, then you know that, there's, that you're onto something. So he twice calls on Hamlet to protect her. Okay, so he says, the ghost says here, okay, you have to get revenge. Claudius is the snake and he must be killed. Uh, you have to get your revenge, but how so howsomever thou pursuest this act of revenge taint not thy mind nor let thy soul contrive against thy mother aught don't touch your husband don't touch uh uh your mother leave her alone dc don't uh, don't fight against your mother leave her to heaven and to those thorns that in her bosom lodge to prick and sting her so a couple of things going on here not simply just don't 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 upset your mother but look at this He's he, he's he's thinking of her. He's thinking of her. Have how she feels. He's looking at her 
and seen her agony, and he wants to protect her from the winds of that agony, do you see? He's, he's in deep thinking about how she feels. He's vividly aware of her suffering. That's not narcissism. That's not selfishness at all. That's the exact opposite. That's an empathy that is very, very deep. He's looking at her, and he's seeing her pricked and stung with her guilt, and he wants to alleviate that. That's very, 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 very interesting. Leave her to heaven. Heaven, heaven, heaven will take care of it. Again, he says, but look, amazement on the mother sits, and this is the scene what's happening here, but look, amazement on the mother sits, O oh, step between her and her fighting soul. So please protect her. So the, the, the conversation was going this way, and then he turns and he sees how distraught she is, and he, he turns it around and says, look, take, take care of your mother, take care of your mother. Nice guy, nice guy, nice guy. Conceit in weakest body's strongest uh, uh, works. So what he's saying here is uh, con uh, conceit here means imagination. So she doesn't know what the hell's going on. She can't see the ghost, right? And so her imagination is going wild about her poor son going crazy. So he says, uh, um, in the weakest bodies, meaning women, okay, uh, uh, this imagination, this this anxiety, this neurosis is stronger, which is partly true because women tend to be higher in uh, neurotic uh, uh, feelings than than men. But but he's again he's trying to protect her. Now that's compassion for her weakness. Again, it's not anger. She betrayed him. He doesn't call for revenge against her. He wants to protect her. It's a compassion for her own weakness. Now, whether, you can argue whether or not that that's, uh, that's part of the, the um, suffocating uh, uh, attitude of the, of the husband to the wife, uh, but the feeling is there. He does want to protect her. So I think he's a pretty good husband. All, well, he's in that, in that regard, he's a decent man. In other regards that I'm going to argue, uh, not so much. Uh, and this is part of it here. He's a bit of a puritanical stuffed shirt, and I'm not quite sure if you would want to be married to a guy like that. And guys, would you like to be married to a perfect person like that? That's another question. There's certainly lots of evidence that Prince Hamlet is a puritanical stuffed shirt, and there's a bit of evidence that his father was as well, and I'm going to try to lay that out today. If King Hamlet was such a great husband as we've just discussed, why did Gertrude cheat on him with Claudius, or why did she, if she wasn't cheating with him, why did she fall in love with Claudius so quickly after uh, he died, the, her husband died? Did she rebel against King Hamlet's smug perfection? Nobility and dignity can be boring and suffocating. Perfection's mere existence is an imposition and an, ac and, and an accusation. We secretly, guiltily resent heroes. We really, really do. Again, imagine being married to that guy. You might be swept off your feet by this guy, but you'd be married to him for seven years, and you'd be, re you'd be ready to, to find somebody who's a little bit less perfect. The same thing with uh, someone like Hermione Granger. These heroes, uh, love requires a kind of pity. That's, that's the Christ-like pity. Christ suffers, and it makes it very easy for us to love him. If you are, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about it uh, in, in a Christian uh, religious sense, but just a cultural sense. Uh, Christ evokes pity. So does, so does the Buddha, for example. Uh, but, but the God figure is too cold, glassy and steely like superman it, it's that that's a god figure do you see you can't love a god because they're cold and distant uh in order for love to 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 uh to arise we need a kind of kryptonite we need that pity to be built into the system and we do quite literally get we get uh, 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 Superman's uh, kryptonite and Hermione Granger has her kryptonite too which is her lack of social skills uh, and she has a really hard time dealing with people because she's up here in the clouds like a god do you see so we do we, we resent these heroes uh, love protectiveness can be suffocating and they can oppress us as, I, as I've mentioned and I think that's probably what happened with with Gertrude uh, perhaps that's what happened with Gertrude uh, I do think she probably cheated on him in which case what I'm mentioning here is probably true as well so uh, in terms of the, the puritanical I mean the, this this noble and nobility and dignity is all fine and good, but you also want to be someone who can be earthy and down to earth and, and get into the mud with people. Someone, something like, like Hermione Granger can't because she's up in the clouds, as I've mentioned. And, and, and Hamlet has a hard time with that. And I think King Hamlet probably did as well. So Hamlet says, the king doth wake tonight. So he's, he's talking to uh, um, 
uh, Horatio, and he's complaining that Denmark is a bunch of partiers. They're, they're a bunch of drunken partiers. And he complains, he says to Horatio, he says, The king doth make, does wake tonight and take his rouse, keeps with sail and the swaggering upskin re- ups, upswing reels. They're partying again, they're drinking again, they're dancing again. And Horatio says, Is it the custom? It has always happened. He says, I, Mary, it is the custom. But to my mind, it is a custom that is more honorable if you break the custom, custom than if you observe the custom. Them. So here's very clear evidence, and I've argued in my Hamlet video, that he, Hamlet's a prig. He's a puritanical prig. He certainly is. He doesn't like the real physical world. He, he wants to live in this Apollonian realm uh, uh, of, uh, of, of God, like perfection, D.C. And that's where his father is now, because he's, he's distant, uh, and, and he's no longer on the messy earth. So no fun prince. Like father, like son, Claudius is a party king in strong contrast to the brother and in strong contrast to the son as well. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. That's, that's, that's genetically true. We inherit personality traits. We do. And then and the environment works on those traits uh, to, to make us who we are. So I think uh, probably King Hamlet, this is some evidence. It's not very strong, but it's some evidence that King Hamlet was this kind of puritanical guy, as fierce as a warrior uh, uh, that he was. Now, I've talked about these images in my other videos, and I think they're so useful. They're very, very useful. Uh, The complexity of human nature was personified by the Greek gods. Go make sure you read your Greek myths. Read those Greek myths. The Dionysian energies encompass the earthbound physical passions. He's Dionysus Bacchus, the god of wine, the god of revels, the god of Claudius, do you see? And the Apollonian god, Apollo, Hyperion sun god, the Apollonian energies encompass uh, our higher intellectual faculties, reason, art, science, and spirituality. And that's certainly uh, Hamlet, of course. That's where Hamlet wants to live. Uh, we, have a, we have a kind of crack up, a kind of schizophrenic break in our psyches if we can't harmonize these two, these two elements. Puritanical Prince Hamlet is disgusted by Claudius's indulgence in earthly pleasures, as we've just mentioned here. He hates partying. What's wrong with partying? Come on. What's wrong with, with dancing? Really? You're complaining about upswing? Up, up spring reels really you're complaining about that maybe there's too much of it maybe claudius is this kind of drunken lout this kind of drunken pig and there's too much dancing because too much dancing is not good too much bacchus too much apollo and you got you got some problems so whether the fault of excess lies with the debauched claudius or the priggish father and son hamlet is debatable we really don't know but i i suspect that hamlet has too much of this and claudius has too much of that that's what shakespeare is getting at shakespeare talks about these things in other plays as well uh, uh he, he really if you're, the, he, he does he makes a clear distinction of characters who are not likable characters are too much of one and too much of the other and the characters that we admire the real heroes of stories like twelfth night go back and watch my twelfth night videos really 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 interesting uh the characters that we love in Twelfth Night are the characters that have both of those things in equal in equal balance, yin and the yang. Uh, was the father the source of the hun- of the son's disgust with sexuality? Uh, the tree that falls, uh, the apple that falls not so far from the tree? I actually think so. So here's some more evidence here uh, of the ghost speaking, uh, the prig, the prudish, puritanical ghost speaking, but virtues as it never will be moved, though lewdness courted in the shape of heaven, so lust, though to the radiant angel linked, will sate itself in a celestial bed and prey on garbage. So you can't, virtue can never defeat lewdness and lust. Lust will always, that's that, that's that's the Dionysian earthly energies, lust, sexual desire, will always beat, will always triumph over virtue. And, and we, virtue, will end up preying on garbage. Now, that's an image of uh, sex as rubbish, as not just, not just rubbish, actually, not just garbage, but in, 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 in Shakespearean times, garbage actually meant the entrails, the rotting entrails of a, of a dead creature, do you see? Uh, so there's that disgust with physicality, that disgust with physicality uh, that, that we definitely see in Hamlet, and there's a hint of it here uh, with the ghost as well. Now, whether or not it's justified, because, again, Claudius might have been this lout and too much of that, Shakespeare, uh, in one of his sonnets, he rips into uh, how disgusting lust is when it's separated from uh, love. Um, I can't remember the number of the, of the sonnet, but yeah, he, 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 he talks about it a lot. So yeah, I, I think so. I think he might have been uh, a puritanical kind of guy. Again, go back and watch my uh, Puritan puritanism video, and you'll see me talk about this in a lot more detail. But I do think that uh, King Hamlet loved his wife. He was a good husband. He was a good, loving husband. But he was probably suffocating, do you see? Uh, and and, and that, that puritanical stuffed shirt 
aspect of him probably drove Gertrude away from him towards a more fun, earthy guy like Claudius, perhaps. Arrogant and domineering? That's another question, but there is some strong proof for that. If you get murdered by your younger brother, what does that say about you as an older brother? Probably something. Not necessarily, because the Cain and Abel story is ambiguous. Um, we, we, uh, Abel pleased God more than Cain, and so Cain was resentful, and he murdered his brother for revenge. We don't quite know whether or not uh, it's just crap luck or whether or not Abel really was a superior guy and uh, Cain was a bit of a slouch and he didn't live up to his uh, obligations to God. We're not quite sure. And so we're not quite sure again whether or not Claudius was kind of justified. Well, you're never justified for murder, but you know what I mean. Kind of justified and like there was a reason. Yeah, my older brother was a jerk. He was a real jerk to me my whole life and I got revenge by killing him and stealing his crown and his wife. If if we had a backstory for uh, old King Hamlet, and it showed him to be a real, real tyrant, then maybe we could sympathize, sympathize with Claudius. Uh, was that the case? Uh, probably not extreme, as extreme as, as that, but certainly there was this relationship going on, I believe. This was Claudius, and this was King Hamlet. He was the abler. Uh, 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 King Hamlet was the abler, a uh, more liked uh, older brother, and that caused the resentment of Cain uh, to grow in Claudius. So Claudius probably grew up in the shadow of a more talented, better looking, more physically capable older brother. So go back and look at what we just talked about in point one and point two, the warrior and the good king. He was a great warrior, fierce warrior, and a good king. Everybody loved him. Everybody loved him. Poor Ron. What's Ron going to do? It's, it, it's so, so tough, do you see? Even without being openly bullied, and Ron is never openly bullied by his older brothers. Percy is a bit of a prig, but he doesn't, they don't openly bully Ron. They tease him a bit, but brothers tease. But even without an open bullying cruelty, it's not easy being the runt. The Weasleyan hero is the one who, who, who finds a way. He goes through, he's tortured. He's tortured, and he's tempted to, to, be the, to become the Kane, to become the Joker. Joker and Batman are the same characters. Batman is the superior older brother. And, and Joker is, 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 is the runt. And we, Ron Weasley is the Weasley in Hero in that he defeats that growing resentment in him. It's very, very interesting. Please go watch that Brother Murder video. It's so, so fascinating. So the future King Hamlet certainly made Claudius feel in fear. Certainly, certainly, certainly. Even though King Hamlet was a good older brother, the younger brother certainly felt inferior. I'm, I'm convinced. Uh, but did the older brother overtly mock and bully, that could explain uh, Claudius's murderous resentment. So here's an indication that maybe he was this kind of bully. Uh, the ghost says to Hamlet, oh, Hamlet, what a falling off was there from me. Like, we, we already looked at this, but you know, he, look, look, my Gertrude went from me to this wretch whose natural gifts were uh, poor to those of mine. Now, if, if in life growing up, the older brother made those feelings known to the world in front of the younger brother, then yeah, I'd probably want to kill my older brother too. I wouldn't, but you know, you could, you can, you understand where the resentment comes from. So is this honesty or is it sheer arrogance? King Hamlet was probably certainly the, mo the more successful youth. There's some more evidence here. Uh, Hamlet says he's showing a picture of the two of them uh, to Gertrude, and she says, this was your king, this noble god, four gods, as we've just talked about. Look what you have now. Here is your new husband. He's like a mildewed ear of corn next to healthy ears of corn. And the, uh, the, the, the unhealthy, diseased, mildewed ear is infecting the good ear, do you see? The wholesome brother. Wow, that's, that's brutal. But he's, they're looking at an image. And it suggests that, yeah, one guy is not as good looking as the other guys. That's what that image says. And they're looking at an image. And Gertrude, this is, this is where they're looking at it. And Gertrude is not disagreeing, do you see? There, she's not disagreeing. She sees that her previous husband was a really, really noble, great guy, do you see? So, yeah, Ron, a mildewed ear. It's really, really cruel, but some people are better looking than others, and it's, it's, a, it's a bitter pill to swallow. So I do think uh, that, that if not an overtly, physically, and cruelly, uh, verbally bullying brother, then certainly uh, uh, he, he made his younger brother Claudius feel, uh, feel bad about himself. Now, was he a bully father? There's evidence for that, too.
Hamlet's shame, suicidal thoughts, and unreasonable idealization of his father all suggest a pathological relationship between the two, a pathological relationship that's probably similar to the, the older brother, younger brother relationship that we just talked about. Uh, did King Hamlet directly or indirectly make his son feel inferior and inadequate? Almost certainly, yes. Directly, possibly. Uh, children pick up on, even if it's not direct, the children do pick up on subtle cues of disapproval. Uh, a parent just with the raise of an eyebrow or the twitch of a head or the turn of the body can give a signal to a child that the child is inadequate, do you see? Um, look, 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 look at it in your own life and in the lives of the people around you. It, it can be devastating to a child. And we have in the play, I'm going to look at a few examples here where, where some of the things that the, that the ghost, the father says to the son are, are in, in what he says to the son are are uh, um, are embedded these these not quite passive aggressive insults but these imply implications these these implied insults so here's the pathological relationship as, as we've already looked at these two quotes so excellent to king was my father to claudius he was so much better than claudius uh, uh he my father was like a sun god and claudius is like a half goat satyr do you see so there's an idealization he's comparing his father to a god and we've looked we've just looked at four gods previously and here's the sun god again the highest of the god one of the highest of the gods so if the father is seen by the child as a god then what does that mean that implies awe and when you are exposed to the Godhead, to the, the source of everything in the universe, your initial response is awe. And awe means a paralysis. It means a kind of fear, do you see? And that's how Hamlet saw his father for sure. Uh, I, I'm convinced. Again, we see the same kind of thing here. My father's brother, but no more like my father. So yes, so so uh, you married to Claudius, my father's brother, but... Claudius was no more like my father than I to Hercules. Well, what's that? That's the exact opposite. I am the exact opposite to Hercules. I'm exact the exact opposite to this God figure. I am no God. So there's that the, the feelings of shame, worthlessness, and powerlessness. So do Hamlet's depression and suicidal thoughts stem from a sense of powerlessness caused by an inability to emerge from the father's shadow? Very, very likely. Very, very likely. Uh, parents must symbolically die so that the youth can become who they are. That's Carl Jung. This is the most this is the most interesting thing I've ever encountered. And great literature, directly or indirectly, discusses this a lot. Most famously, recently, in uh, the Harry Potter series, when Dumbledore dies, a beautiful, beautiful scene, uh, and brilliantly, psychologically accurate. It's the good death of the father is a voluntary death, the father that steps aside and says, okay, I'm, I'm finished, I'm finished. I've done everything that I can do on earth. Okay, son, daughter, go get him. Go get him, youngin, is what the father is supposed to say, and the mother too. But the, 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 the Oedipal moms and the tyrannical fathers don't do that. They say, no, Voldemort stays on top. All youth on earth shall be subordinate to me, says the tyrant Voldemort, do you see? So what does King Hamlet do? He comes back from the grave. He comes back from the grave like Voldemort and says, no, you're not you, Hamlet. I'm not getting out of the way so you can become you. You are going to be in service of me. Now, it's debatable whether or not it's, it's legitimate for the, for the father to say, no, you just do this one thing, just get the revenge, and then, then, then I'll get out of the way. That's part of it. But the, the father doesn't uh, 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 understand that, that the son is not that kind of guy. He's not that kind of hero. So King Hamlet dominated his son in life, as we've suggested, and then on into death, resulting in Hamlet's inability to confidently confront the trials of life as his own man. If the parent doesn't get out of the way, the young person can't grow into themselves. And here's Hamlet with that completely defeated, defeated, defeated attitude. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh or sullied flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. An absolute lack of power. He doesn't even have the power to kill himself. He just wants to not wake up. He wants to fade and dissolve into the universe. That's a person, that's a young person with zero will of their own because all of the, all of the energies of his life have been sucked into the father by uh, the... the uh, the unreasonable demand of, of the father on the son. Uh, it's unreasonable because Hamlet's not that kind of guy. So he's, he's unready for the world. He's a malformed psyche. And the parents have one job. One job is to, to get their kids' psyches well-formed and not malformed. But King Hamlet doesn't do that. He demands of his son what his son cannot deliver. You have to be an ancient warrior hero and stab someone in the 
eyeball. If you're not a murderer, you can't do that. If you're not uh, that kind of warrior, you can't do that. The warrior father fails to understand the new age sensitive, sensitive son's very, very different nature. Now, is that the is that a, a, a cause of of is that the result of neglect or lack of interest in his son? Did the father not pay enough attention to the son? And say, oh, this is what my son is. He's a scholar. He's a brilliant scholar. He's going to go off to Paris and study. He's going to go off to Wittenberg and become a famous writer. That's not what the father says. He says, no, 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 come back, famous writer. Forget writing. Forget that soft stuff. You have to become the ancient warrior. You have to become like me, is what the father says. Lack of interest, a contempt for Hamlet's softness, a narcissistic lack of concern, as I've just suggested. Probably. So here are those psychological, uh, uh, devastating psychological uh, insinuations. So when he confronts, when the ghost confronts Hamlet and says, you have to get revenge, Hamlet says, yes, I will get revenge. That's my bound to duty to do that. He says, good, I find the apt. Good son, good job, son, go get him. Doesn't stop there. What he says is, and duller shouldst thou be than the fat weed that rots itself in ease on Lethe wharf, wouldst thou not stir. If you don't do this, you are this, a contemptible wretch if you don't do it. And there's really, really interesting imagery here. He says, uh, uh, Lethe is the, the river in the underworld uh, um, whereby when you enter, you forget your life on earth and you enter the new, uh, uh, the nether regions of the afterlife, do you see? So there's a forgetfulness. And this rotting image, you're a useless wretch. You're a useless man if you can't take action to see. You're rotting like a fat weed on the edge of the river of forgetfulness. Now that word fat is important too because in at the end, the very end of the play, Gertrude calls Hamlet fat. And uh, Burbage was the actor that Shakespeare had on stage. I think that was the guy's name. I might be wrong. Uh, anyway, so, the, so the, the actor that was playing Hamlet that was working with Shakespeare's company was fat. And so uh, the, the conjecture is, is that, uh, th that Gertrude says that, oh, he's give, him, give Hamlet some water because he's fat and he's not, he's not doing a good job uh, fencing in the final scene. Uh, and when the, when the actor himself was fat. So the repetition of the word or the, or the, first, uh, the first indication of the word fat here, and you see a character on stage who's actually fat, that again is that accusation of the father uh, to the son. There's a contempt for softness, a contempt for inaction from the man of action. Same thing, same kind of thing here. If thou hast nature in thee, bear it not. Let not the royal bed of Denmark be a couch for luxury and damned incest. Again, there's that contempt for luxury, a contempt for, for pleasure, a, a puritanical contempt for pleasure, perhaps. But look at this. If you have nature in you, bear it not. Again, there's an accusation. There's an implied accusation suggesting this lack of confidence, an insinuation that you don't have nature in you. And the nature has a double meaning here. One, it means the, uh, uh, natural filial piety, which means uh, respect for your elders. So if you do have that respect for your elders, then, you'll, then you won't bear this. Uh, but it could also mean nature, a man. This guy's idea of what a man is, is this kind of man, the warrior man, not this kind of man, not this kind of new man. So if you're a natural man, you would do this, do you see? So ooh, it's pretty nasty. There's approval here. You're saying, okay, go get him. Good. I'm glad you're going to do your, your job. But it's followed by this doubt. There are subtle, indirect disapproval uh, 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 cues being given to the, to the, to the person. It, there are preemptive accusations. I know you promised to do it, but I know you, man, and you're not a man, man. Do you see? Now, we see this here with the father talking to the son when the son's an adult. You can, you can easily imagine, and this is what we have to do with movies and plays. We have to imagine how they grew up. They probably grew up in a very, very similar way, this way. So that's why Hamlet ends up malformed, because he can't get out from underneath the shadow of the father. Uh, very, very tragic uh, and very real, very, very real. This is why we love Shakespeare, because he portrays people as they really are, not as they should be. Uh, so the father literally haunts the son. There we go. He's not Dumbledore. He doesn't, he doesn't willingly remove himself out of the way of the young person so that the young person can become themselves. He, he comes back from the grave to get in the young person's way. He literally haunts his son, returning to scold him for inadequacy and for rotting in forgetful ease on the banks of the river of forgetfulness. You see, he actually says this. So he comes back. Uh, in Act 3, Scene 4, he says, uh, Hamlet says, Do not come back, your tardy son, to chide. Please don't come back and chide me. That lapsed in time and passion lets go by the 
important acting of your dread commands. Oh, say, please, please don't, don't, don't uh, accuse me of, of being late. I know I'm late. There's that shame, these terrible, terrible feelings of inadequacy. And the ghost says, do not forget this visitation is but to wet thy almost blunted purpose. Again, judgment, accusation of the father. And look at this scene here. This is David Tennant, 2009. It's the best film version that I've seen. Uh, he's not, look at that, it's horrible. He's not even a man-child. A man-child would be a step up. This is a man-infant. He's curled up in a fetal position, okay? It's, it's a brilliant rendering. It's a brilliant uh, version of, 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 of Shakespeare's play. He's a, there's a tortured yearning for the father. Look at him reaching out. And a fear, a dread, dread fear of the Godhead father. Uh, this is a failure, psychological failure of separation, that Harry Potter, Dumbledore separation. There's a failure of that, and there's a failure of individuation of the son or the daughter to become him or herself, do you see? Absolute failure. Look at him. He's, a, he's, an, he's an infant, not a child, an infant. It's, the tr it's an absolute tragedy, and this stuff exists in the real world, and that's why we come back to Hamlet again and again and again. In the closet scene, this is where we are. He first started off by screaming at uh, Gertrude. In the closet scene, only Hamlet can see the ghost suggesting it is a projection, a manifestation of Hamlet's psyche dominated uh, and haunted by his father. Uh, at the very beginning, when the ghost comes, everybody else can see the ghost. Uh, Horatio and the guards can see the ghost, suggesting that it's a real ghost. Sure, it's a Hollywood kind of uh, uh, thriller. Fair enough. But in this closet scene, Shakespeare changes changes up. Why? Why? Gertrude can't see the ghost. She says, alas, how is it with you, Hamlet? What's going on? That you do bend your eye on vacancy. You're looking at nothing. And with the incorporeal, unbodied, no-bodied air, do you hold discourse. You're talking to the air. Forth at your eyes, your spirits wildly peep. So you're, you're doing this. You're looking, you're looking crazy. What's going on? So she can't see the ghost. I think this is probably a psychotic break with reality. Uh, psychosis can, can be the result of many things, of course, and I'm no expert, but one, one psych, psychosis can be the result of uh, intense, intense, intense anxiety, depression, anxiety, depression, ratcheted up so far that the brain just can't handle it anymore and you lose touch with reality. And I think that's probably what's happened here. What Shakespeare wants to imply is happening here. Very, very interesting stuff, very, very tragic stuff, but uh, it answers the question, was King Hamlet a good father? Probably not. Was he overbearing to his brother? Probably. Was he a great husband? Yes and no, as we've seen. Uh, very, very complex character. All right, so let's leave the psychology behind and look at some of the uh, uh, plot device elements. Uh, um, he is. He, he's all those psychological things that we've just looked at, uh, but he's also a really cool plot device, and we're going to look at that now. So all of that psychological stuff about King Hamlet uh, was, was, was what I find most interesting. But it's also cool. If you're interested in storytelling and how stories are made, then you might be interested to, to, to listen to this about King Hamlet as a very important part of the revenge plot device. You may or may not be aware that Shakespeare was a very good businessman. He was a very good Hollywoody kind of writer. He wanted to make a lot of money. He wanted to please people. And at the time, the Spanish tragedy was a really, really famous blockbuster play. And it was uh, it was about, uh, uh, it was a revenge plot, very, very much in line with our revenge plots that we see in Hollywood thrillers today, like John Wick. Uh, so this is a model that I look at. If you go back and watch my videos, the revenge parts one, two, and three, I actually compare it. I, I add a little bit of John Wick comparison in there to show you that Shakespeare's play is not unlike uh, Hollywood blockbusters, thrillers. Um, in revenge plot, all revenge plots, whether it's Hollywood or Shakespeare, they have to have an inciting incident, and it usually happens off stage. It can happen early in the play or the movie, but, uh, but in this case, it happens off stage. King Hamlet's first act in the play is actually before the play begins, and he actually just gets killed. But if he didn't get killed, we wouldn't have a, a need for revenge. You wouldn't have that obligation. So early in the play, of course, the ghost comes back and the ghost says, remember me, that's the memory, that's the imposition uh, uh, by a ghost, by a memory on the hero to get revenge. Uh, other elements of revenge plot I'll very quickly look at. Uh, in all revenge stories, there's always a buddy, there's always Horatio, there's always Han Solo for Luke Skywalker. The hero very often has to become a detective. There's a mystery to be unsolved before he can he can actually commit the, the final deed that he has to do. So Hamlet becomes a detective. 
the play is the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. Uh, revenge has to be frustrated. So there must be a moment where John Wick is just about to kill him, but then the hero slips, uh, sorry, the villain slips out of, uh, from, from his fingers. And the same thing happens here. Hamlet says, now might I do it, Pat? But the hero slips away, uh, sorry, the villain slips away because of, the, because of the hero's dithering. Do you see how genius Shakespeare is at manipulating a very, very tried and true plot, uh, plot structure? Uh, so that frustrated revenge calls for more obligation. And that's when we see again, King Hamlet, the ghost, comes back to remind him, look, you let the guy slip through your fingers too many times. Smarten up, he says. There must be henchmen. John Wick has all these henchmen, the minor mini bosses that has to be killed before you get to the big boss. And Hamlet, of course, has Gildenstern and Rosencrantz and Polonius that he has to get rid of. Uh, there's a, always a moment in these stories, these thrillers, always, 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 where the hero is at the mercy of the villain. We have tremendous sympathy for the hero because the hero is getting beaten up really, really bad by the villain. And that happens very often, more than once in a, in a Hollywood blockbuster. And just like John Wick is tied to the chair and being interrogated by, his, by the villain in John Wick, uh, Claudius ties, literally ties Hamlet to the chair in the 2009 version. Then, of course, uh, we have the satisfying moment where the, the revenge has been achieved. And in Hamlet, we see it, but it's, it's, it's tainted because it's not a, it's not a straight up victory. Uh, we don't leave feeling good because everybody's died. And then, of course, all stories have to have a kind of denouement, wrap things up. And because a, a revenge plot uh, is about death, then we usually have some kind of existential uh, uh, musings about the nature of life and death. And in John Wick, we see that too. It's very, very interesting. Okay, so to, to go back up and bring this more tightly into the character of King Hamlet, which is why we're here, uh, we'll talk about this again very quickly. So all revenge genre stories require an inciting incident. There's a transgression, some kind of crime, some kind of injustice, a violation of moral codes. There must be a creation of wasteland. And again, go back and watch my video, uh, my wasteland video, which is really, really interesting. Um, uh, without without the wasteland, without there's something being wrong with the universe, there's no need for any hero story whatsoever because you don't need a hero because everything's fine. So you need a kind of wasteland and and, 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 and that requires some kind of inciting incident. You have to have a transgression, a transgressor. You have to have the villain that provides, in the plot sense, it provides something to do for two hours. <laughs> you gotta have something. The hero has to have something to do and that's the villain. That's the target. That's the goal. That's what you're looking for. You have to have a victim, of course. You have to have a person, or the victim could be a principal. It could be society generally that's been violated and, uh, and that has to be avenged. And of course, we have uh, the father in this case. And of course, the, the, that obligation, there must be a call to action. There must be some kind of deathbed promise, which is kind of what uh, happens in Hamlet. It's a beyond the grave promise. Uh, there must be some kind of memory of something wrong. There must be some kind of duty that must be fulfilled. And in John Wick, it's the memory of love. It's the memory of his love that, that was violated. Um, uh, by, by the villains, by the killing of the dog, which is a symbol of love in the first John Wick. Uh, so what, what is King Hamlet? He is the victim. He is the memory, and he is the one who imposes the obligation. And so here we see the quotes right here. He comes back and very, very clearly says, I am thy father's spirit. I'm the ghost that has come to impose. I'm the memory that has come to impose obligation on the hero so that we can have a really cool story for the next four hours. I am doomed for a certain term to walk the night and for the day confined to fast in fires till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burnt and purged away. Now, Shakespeare adds that detail in there to, to ratchet up the stakes. It wasn't just an accident. There wasn't a car accident where somebody was killed where you can, you can get revenge by simply eliciting a, a, a sincere apology uh, from the, from the quote-unquote villain. No, you ratchet up. If you want a good story, if you want people to be invested, if you want an audience to be invested in the story, you've got to ratchet up the stakes. And the stakes here are high. I was, I was I, my person was violated by the transgressor. He's a victim of injustice. There's a denial of, ab he, he was denied absolution which means I'm, I'm in purgatory now. I'm burning until uh, uh, I'm able to absolve my, my sins. So not only was I killed, but I was killed uh, uh, with my sins in f in, in uh, full, my sins full blown, uh, and therefore I can't rest. So the stakes are high. Uh, the ghost again, he says, list, list, listen, Hamlet, if thou dost ever love thy dear father, O God, revenge this foul and most unnatural ver uh, uh, murder. So again, there's that, that obligation, the deathbed promise, the beyond the grave promise. Uh, and the hero has to accept it. That happens early in the play. Okay, the, the obligation comes along and the hero says, yeah, okay, I'll do it. 
oh, that's what's happened? All right, I got this. I'm the hero, says John Wick. I got this, says Hamlet. Haste me to know it that I with wings as swift as meditation or the thoughts of love may sweep to my revenge. Now listen to the words here. Listen to the ornate words. This is a scholar speaking, not a hero. This is not John Wick speaking. This is a philosopher speaking. He uses all these fancy words, 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 and he doesn't do any action whatsoever. Compare that to Laertes. When Laertes is told to get revenge, when Laertes receives his obligation notice, Laertes says, yeah, tell me what to do and I'll cut his throat in the church. That's what I will do. Laertes, clear, direct, simple, brutal, grammatical, syntactic language, says Laertes, not so much Hamlet. So again, there's a variation on the, on the revenge plot structure. We've got a revenge hero who is not much of a revenge hero, DC. But in terms of King Hamlet, he is very, very much a very, very useful device. He is simply a device to kick a story into high gear, to kick off a thriller. That's how stories work, ladies and gentlemen. That's pretty cool. And that was Five Quote Shakespeare, Hamlet Character Analysis, King Hamlet, Old King Hamlet. I hope you found the video useful. And if you did, please like and subscribe. And don't forget to pick up a copy of the PDFs if you need them. Thanks for watching.